you. Stand by. Here we go. For my tribe, my gut is not always the most cooperative. Since implementing Megaspore Did you know that you can rate our shows on iTunes? The views expressed on contacttalkradio.com are those of the guest hosts and callers and not necessarily of this station, its management, or other advertisers. Hello and welcome to the Three Eyes Podcast with your host, Megan Sweet, applying intellect, insight, and intuition to promote personal and school-wide transformation. We'll be talking about education, mindfulness, and transformations large and small. We'll be talking to people who are applying their intellect, their insight, and their intuition to promote either their personal or school-wide transformations. While this podcast is specifically for educators, anyone can get some information out of this. To learn more about it, to access our blogs, free downloads, and our calendar events, please come over to our website at www dot your three eyes dot com that's spelled y-o-u-r the number three e-y-e-s dot com hello and welcome everybody to the three your three eyes podcast today today i have uh the get my guest is peggy cappy who is the creator of the pbs series yoga for uh, the rest of us. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, how she came to create that series, but also about reality, um, building the mind body connection and um, some of the work that she's done in India. So I'm, I'm really excited to have Peggy here. Um, before I have Peggy on, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a framing about where we're going uh, for the next uh, few uh, episodes here on Your Three Eyes. We're going to be talking a lot more about building this mind body connection and why it's important um it's a definitely an intrinsic part of the three thing and talking about here um when we get out of our heads uh, information that's available for us when we are able to connect in that place so um we're really excited to be able to talk with Peggy, who can help give us a little bit more information about how to build that mind-body connection. Uh, we'll also have a few more guests in the coming weeks that talk to us as well, um, including Zen Cryer de Brooke, who has a, a whole course and, and training series on how to start to use that mind-body connection to give yourself some guidance. Um, and somebody who is a Feldenkrais uh, specialist on how to start to heal your body so that you can make a better mind-body connection I'll also be offering sections from my book and some helpful activities and um, body scans and mindfulness practices to help us to build that connection as well. Um, but today we're talking with Peggy and I'm, I'm really excited to have her here. Uh, your Yoga for the Rest of Us, which is a series um, that included nine different special programs. Peggy is the founder of the Gentle Stretch Yoga for Seniors and others who need gentle and modified approach to yoga. Peggy has perfected an adaptable yoga program that is easy, effective, and enjoyable. Peggy's unique approach to yoga has adults finding that they have the energy and flexibility they never dreamed possible at their age. For 50 years, Peggy Cappy has been practicing and teaching yoga, meditation, and guided relaxation, helping um, others to create greater comfort and ease in the body, mind, and spirit. Her studies have taken her to India, the source of yoga, to study with yoga and meditation masters. Peggy's desire to create the Peggy Cappy Yoga for the Rest of Us DVD series came from her interaction with, sorry, I'm gonna scroll down friends, um, when, with her interaction with um, a, lot, a group of elders that she'd been teaching. And the average age of, those, of that group of people that she'd been teaching was uh, over 80 and her oldest student was 100 years old. Uh, before the success, because of the success of her uh, DVD series and all, video, all of her video series were ranked number one. Um, uh, she was also then asked to write a book on yoga. And so Peggy's book, Yoga for All of Us, was released in 2006. Um, and in the book, each pose is described in detail with an easy to follow instructions. Her book is a great reference for anybody who would like to extend their yoga practice beyond the material presented in the DVDs. In addition to all of that, Peggy has also created audio programs that teach meditation and breathing techniques. And she knows that people often um, need special help in learning how to relax. Uh, Peggy's audio programs for relaxation are designed to take you to a place of comfort in 15 minutes of listening. 
um, and maybe most significant of Peggy's skills and talents is her work as a medical hypnotherapist, which she has practiced since 1992. She sees clients from around the world and helps those who find her through the word of mouth since she does not advertise this specialty. Um, and finally, we'll also be talking with Peggy about her studies and travels and her deep connection with India and the way that's informing her work today. So Peggy, that's an impressive, impressive resume. Uh, thank you for, for sharing that. And um, tell me a little bit more about you. Um, I believe that uh, we have an awakening of the awareness that we can get better with age rather than see a decline. But it takes a certain amount of personal responsibility to put practices into place that enhance life so that you can live with vitality. I'm in my 70s now and I have never felt more vital, more rejuvenated, um, more enthusiastic about um, being able to participate in what I love. And that's truly what I wish for all of your listeners is that they can have the energy that not only goes into their chosen profession that helps everyone, but they can have the energy to do the things that most have most meaning for them. Um, because life, I believe, should be uh, very vital and rewarding. And I know all of us have many things to juggle, families and uh, professions and household chores and uh, sometimes our health gets out of balance and that takes precedence. So there's this whole continuum of uh, what we, um, what, what's, in, what's in front of us and what we have to deal with. And my interest is helping people live more freely, more fully, and with greater ease and happiness. That's a, a really amazing and wonderful mission, uh, Peggy. And I'm just wondering how you started to, you found your way to it in the beginning. So you, you have a long practice that you're building upon now, but I'm wondering how um, 50 years ago that started for you and how you've been watching it evolve um, as your life has progressed. Well, 50 years ago, I was an anthropologist and I lived with an indigenous tribe in Papua New Guinea. I was supported by National Geographic and uh, did a lot of film work and uh, photography. And um, on the way back from that two year stint, we, my husband and I, I was married early. My husband and I traveled through Southeast Asia, India and Nepal and Egypt and went to the kind of sacred sites of all those places and became intrigued with uh, yoga and meditation and decided that when I got back to the US, I would look up more about meditation and more about yoga. And what happened is with my first experience, my very first yoga class, most yoga classes end in a place of deep relaxation in a pose called Shavasana, where you just really lie on the floor and totally let go. I had um, a, a remarkable experience as if I was floating and I said mm -hmm. after that class, I am doing yoga for the rest of my life. No question. Mm -hmm. And same with meditation. I went and found instruction in meditation. And from the first experience, many people have trouble getting started. But from my first experience, I experienced uh, such a deep uh, restful place that I also said, okay, this too, I'm doing for the rest of my life. And now I just want to help people find that restful place for themselves where they can really renew themselves and, uh, and feel incredible. Why do you think you're able to connect to that so easily, that restful place? And, and I ask with full jealousy and um, uh, a deep desire to do that. For, for me, I always have such a hard time turning my, my mind off. So I'm wondering for you, yeah, and how you were able to accomplish that. That's the case for most people. I mean, it's when most people talk about having difficulty with meditation, it's just those thoughts get in the way and, you know, you think about what you're going to have for the next meal or, you know, just the, the whole slew of thoughts. Um, I think I started with a form of meditation that just said, essentially, don't worry about thinking. Don't, you know, you're going to, it's the nature of the mind to think. So just don't worry about it. 
you need to focus your mind and you can focus it in many ways on the breathing, on uh, a special syllable or even with counting, something that will take the attention of the mind and sure thoughts will blip up, but you want to look for that that place. Right now, I'm currently passionate about the opportunities we have using the breath, which is one of the few things in the body that happens spontaneously without or having to think about it, happens ongoing, but it's also something that we can modify. We can take a longer inhale, a longer exhale. We can emphasize the pause at the end of each, and there's great gifts really immediate gifts working with the breath. Yeah. You know, I noticed that myself, it's often the one place where I'm, I'm best able to start to connect in is, um, through the breath. And, and actually with my son, I use it a lot because, um, it's one of those things that you can a little bit do on the spot. Um, so you don't have to, sit down and find your meditation cushion or all the things yeah. that people put in their heads about how to start using the breath right away, although those are beneficial. It's something that you can do in the moment. And so um, actually even just last night, I, my, I was triggering my son um, or the night before last. And I saw him before he said anything, he said he took a long inhale and exhale and just recentered wow. himself before wow. engaged with me. He's 10, I thought that was quite extraordinary. Um, well, and I know I that I've, I've learned to do that too. You know, it's such a it's such a gift to teach someone how to calm themselves. We live in a stressed uh, environment. Uh, it's just there's so many things that rev up our nervous system, and the breath is a very useful tool to calm the nervous system. So, for example, I was talking. I was going to take my um, granddaughters who are teenagers to the mall to do some before school, you know, before school shopping. And one of them said she was just, uh, she's just on some medication that makes her really anxious. And she, she just said, I'm feeling so anxious inside. And I said, oh, sweetie, that's really easy to intervene. And, and, and I said, do this for me. And so essentially, and your, your listeners can do this. You just take a deep breath in, let it out through the mouth. One more, let it out through the mouth. That brings our, our breathing kind of to a neutral place. And now we can begin to take a deep breath in and then begin to extend the exhale to twice the length of the inhale. So it means slowing down the breath, the flow of the breath that comes out. And so if, if your listeners will do that deep breath in, through the nose and now out through the nose, long and slow. And then with the next one, you can consciously invite the muscles of the body to relax as well. So any customary places of holding tightness or tension can just be released. And I'll tell you that my granddaughter said after four of those breaths, four breaths making the exhale about twice the length of the inhale, she went, it's gone. My anxiety has gone. I feel great. And, and isn't it amazing that something so simple and takes such a short amount of time has the ability to help bring our thoughts to a more easy place bring our bodies to a place of greater relaxation and bring our whole beings to a different level of interaction with the environment. Such a, I mean, even you doing it now, it was powerful for me. I've been, I was telling Peggy before the show that it's, it's Friday the 13th and all the things are happening today on Friday the 13th including if you're watching our video uh, live, you can't see my face because we're having all sorts of, of internet challenges on my end. Um, and so I was feeling a little bit anxious, but even just doing that breath practice right now, I felt so much calmer. And I think a lot about the application in schools because, you know, as you're saying, your, your daughter, your granddaughter is a teenager and they're often really dysregulated when they come into the classroom um, from things that are happening. You know, students come in with things happening from their personal lives, but also even just <laughs> navigating the hallway between yeah. um, uh, classrooms can be uh, 
really a profound and jarring experience. And what a gift it can be to bring the kids back online again and stabilize their nervous systems before um, jumping into instruction so that kids can learn more effectively and, and actually just engage in a, in a more profound way. Um, so that's you know, really wonderful. I, I've worked in schools from preschool all the way through high school. And I remember at one point uh, I was uh, giving a untimed SAT test uh, for students that that had anxiety and had some learning problems they were allowed to take the sat tests untimed and i said hey you guys we have four hours instead of one so might as well use it to our advantage anytime that you're stuck and you're getting frustrated about an answer just go ahead and put your head on your desk and take a few slow deep breaths and relax and just to, just tell yourself that 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 previously acquired information is just going to be released by the brain <laughs> and and sent out down the arm to your pencil to you know as you record your answers and you can take all the time in the world this one boy really took it to heart really did follow that it took his time but relaxed through the whole test and his score increased by 100 points over 100 points Mm. And that's real, you know, that's, that's real stuff when you can use simple techniques to really teach others how to be more effective and, and, you know, achieve, achieve a, at a much higher rate. Oh, I appreciate that, Peggy. It's such an important part, um, especially as we talk about connections for this in schools. And before we, 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 got on the air, we were talking about the importance of having educators take that time for care and relaxation too. And so maybe when we return from break, number one, you might actually see my face. I'm going to try and get a better internet connection. Um, and two, maybe we can talk a little bit more about some of those connections, but also I'd love to hear about um, how you you lead yoga and and bring these practices to folks who maybe have feel like their bodies aren't able to do that anymore and what lessons can be learned from from that. So we'll be back in two minutes. As uh, well thanks as a, everybody. As well as the story I have about working with some third graders once. I would love to hear that too. Um, there are some of my favorites. So we'll be back in just a couple of moments, hopefully with with me um, live on screen. Go. Oh. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Your Three Eyes. I'm here on screen, which is very exciting. Hopefully this will hold. Um, we're talking with Peggy Cappy today, who has been bringing yoga practices to children and adults uh, for more than 50 years and has a PBS uh, series um, focusing on bringing yoga to everyone, so making it relatable to, to, to all bodies and all ages, which is a really important and profound um, gift to the world. When we went on break, uh, we pre previewed that Peggy can give us a story about bringing um, yoga to third graders, and then maybe we can talk on the other end of the age spectrum to um, how we do, how you bring yoga to folks um, who are in the senior uh, part of their lives. So thanks and welcome back, Peggy. Yes, great. Well, I've taught virtually every kind of group uh, yoga. And uh, one time I was asked to come in to uh, work with a couple third grade cl uh, classes. And this is probably 20 years ago before yoga was all that popular. And the the teachers were kind of skeptical. I don't even know how it was set up. I can't remember how. But they had cleared the desks to the side and they had a couple classes together and the teacher stood in the back of the room kind of um, with arms crossed across their chest like, let's see what you do with this bunch. You know, way do you deal with Billy? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, the kids were kind of jumping off the wall and I just went, I looked at the group and uh, I just went, you know, I have about one minute to gain control or this is going to be over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I issued a challenge to them. I know that each kind of pose has a different physiological effect on the body. And that when you have in drawing poses, it quiets the nervous system. Now I would simply use breath, but then I wanted a posture that would kind of fold inside and calm down all of the energy. And so I challenged the, the third graders I got, uh, I was kneeling on the floor, brought my head down to the floor. It's a, it's a pose called child's pose. And I said, uh, I'm going to look around the room and see who can hold this pose for one minute without even glancing up once. I have a timer. And so I said, who wants to try? Everybody wanted to try. And so they all got down into this pose and it was still and quiet for a full minute. Everybody somehow was able to challenge even the most active that it was worth a try. And the timer went off. And instead of jumping up and being wild and crazy, the pose itself had affected the nervous system of the children. And they lifted their heads quietly and peacefully and the teachers could not believe the change in energy. So mm -hmm. now I had focused energy to work with and we went on to have a fabulous class, but I was so happy that my experiment had worked, which I thought it probably would. So, um, so I think it's so wonderful when people know yoga, that they know that there are poses that will energize them and poses that will quiet them down. So many restorative kind of poses. And we all need that, that skill. We all need those abilities of how to quiet our nervous system because we live in such a, a time that we're easily revved up. We're easily having our emotions out of control. And this is something I wish that was, I thought I wish breath and some simple postures are taught in every school and that all the teachers practice as well. I believe that there's such harmony possible, uh, but it takes self-care and then being able to share that with others. Yeah, I so appreciate you naming that, Peggy, because that's, um, I love the story of the, the third graders. And I, I work in an organization now where we bring mindfulness to children and there's often that same skepticism in the beginning of like okay do your best try you know try meditating with these kids see what <laughs> happens and and the effect is profound and, and I feel like often actually you need to see it to believe it because this idea in practice or in theory is, is is harder to access than actually being present for it um, but I also in my book I wrote a lot about this this idea of learning to care for yourself and to slow down yeah. Because I think when we're running so fast and we're in a world where we, where we 
we are reacting all the time. Yes. Um, it's really hard for us to even be clear about what we want and need and how we're feeling because we're stuck in our head and we're stuck externally. So the gift of, and child's pose in particular, I can see how, especially for children, but for adults too, it, it just brings you back into yourself in such a gentle and nurturing way mm -hmm. and brings you back. And, and again, even with the intentionality of the breath, these are really soft, easy ways to connect back in with ourselves. And once we do that, and can regulate. It's, it's where I talk a lot about the third eye in the book around intuition. That's when the intuition, that's when new information becomes available because we're not externalizing, we're not reacting. We're able to be in a much more grounded space and then we can access information that's just not there when we're revved up. We can see ourselves with a lot more clarity what we're thinking, um, the reactions we're having to our students if we keep it in a school setting or, or to our to anybody, but if we're staying in school to our students. And we can make intentional choices to shift once we can kind of restore again a little bit of that grounding, a little bit of that self-awareness. And then the changes can be profound, both in what we can teach the students, the safety we create for them, and the stability we have within ourselves. I think educators that are, do mindfulness are able to be much more resilient and much more purposeful in their classroom. So it's, I'm so glad that you've been bringing those, those practices to kids for so long and to adults. Um, speaking of adults, maybe you can talk a bit about um, why you've been focusing a lot of your work around bringing yoga to folks that, you know, I was actually talking with a friend of mine this morning about uh, going to yoga. I'm going to go to a yoga class actually this afternoon. And I, I tend to gravitate to yoga classes where there's, less of the showing off, less of the people doing all the hard moves um, because it's not helpful for me. Um, and when I'm in those spaces, it brings brings that kind of energy out of me um, in a way that's not super helpful. So I'm just wondering what drew you to bringing yoga to the audience that you've been focused on and, and what have you seen and learned as you've done that? Well, you know, at first it started with um, a long time ago, I, I believed I should give back to the community. And so I offered to teach some gentle stretches to a retirement community, actually to a, like a nursing home. And I was all gun ho ready to, to, to do yoga with them. And I walked in, it was, uh, they had assembled about 30 people, but half of them were in wheelchairs. Mm. And it was like, well, that I'll just throw those plans out the window and ad lib something. But I got to see how really breaking things down in a way and just doing stretches for the joints um, really helped people. And so when I moved to, I am a resident of New Hampshire. And when I moved there, I uh, started a class that was a modified class. And um, I, I offered an eight week series, that's common. And at the end of the eight weeks, the, the senior said, you can't stop now. This has made a huge difference in our life. You have to just keep this going. So that was literally in the 1980s. Mm. And so that same class still goes on today. Wow. But for over 30 years, close to 35 years, the same class has been meeting and obviously the players have changed, you know, my oldest student who was a hundred, she, she lived to 103. Uh, she was convinced that yoga kept her spry and able. And I mean, she lived on her own up until the age of a hundred. She lived in a two story house, did her own cooking, cleaning, washing. <laughs> and at a hundred, her daughter who didn't live nearby felt like she should go to a, a community mm. and she went downhill pretty quickly <laughs> after that. But anyway, so I have this group and I'm really dedicated to them. And as I continue to learn as a teacher, I bring to that class all of uh, my latest discoveries. We've been working recently a lot with the breath and many different kinds of breathing techniques. And, and I've heard from those students that a lot of times there's more medical intervention in seniors' lives than somebody younger. And if they're having to have a, a painful test, they go, that's no problem. I'll just do my breathing, take my mind elsewhere, and you can work with my body. I mean, yeah. it, sounds, it sounds funny. So um, there's all, I just love this group of people. They, what I have found is the more you need to work on balance or strength or flexibility, 
the more quickly you can see results. And I give everyone a guarantee that no matter how good they are coming into the class, they should always feel better on the exit. Mm. So um, we just have a really, really wonderful time together. We meet every Tuesday morning and unless, unless the class falls on Christmas or New Year's. Those are the only two Tuesdays we don't meet. And so I've trained enough people in my area right now. I'm, I'm not in my home state. And so I have left them in good hands with them. Um, teachers that, that really, really are incredible. In fact, I encourage them, learn from them. You know, I, I teach you what I know, but you know, we can always learn, always learn new. That's such an amazing commitment to, to be doing, um, I mean, I, I think sometimes we forget that yoga, you know, 30, 40 years ago wasn't what it is today, right? Oh. So it's, it's experienced this huge uptake in, um, in practice. In fact, I remember the PBS series with the mornings with yoga. Do you remember the woman's name? I can see Lilius. her face. Lilius, Lilius, that's right. Like she was the only game in town, felt like, yeah. um, for a long, long time. And so the fact that you've had this commitment for such a long period of time is really uh, extraordinary. And I love this idea of not only do I'm sure people's bodies feel better and move around better. I know mine does when I do yoga on a regular basis. Um, and as I've been getting older, I've been noticing how much I've been relying on on those stretches more and more. When I was younger, eh, you know, like this probably would have been really good for me, but like eh, I could go on without it. But now if I don't. Um, it feels really different, but I also love Well, the good news is it's never too late to start. Yeah, never too late to start. And that it helps in other spaces. So I also love that connection you're building to, right? As our bodies get older, we often end up having more medical interventions and things that um, aren't always as pleasant. And for those to be, to be able to apply the yoga practices there too, are, is really wonderful. Yeah. Um, when we come back from break, I would love to talk with you about uh, the work you've done in India, the connections you have there, and especially the work you've done with schools and with girls um, in India, because I think that would be a really profound um, bit of information for, for my audience to listen to, because you've got a bunch of educators listening to you right now. So that we love to hear great. about schools. So, so we'll be back in a couple moments, and we're here with Peggy Cappy on the Your Three Eyes show. Oh, 
Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Your Three Eyes podcast. I'm, I'm here live with Peggy Cappy, who is um, a 50-year yoga practitioner and meditator and who's been bringing uh, these mindfulness practices and these mind-body practices to clients for a long time um, and has a PBS series dedicated to bringing, mindful, uh, bringing yoga excuse me, to, um, to the rest of us, to those of us who aren't um, yogis. Um, and so welcome, Peggy. When we went on break, um, right before break, we said that we'd come back. I'd love to hear about your relationship with India and the work that you've done there. Um, I think it's often a criticism of, of yoga teachers these days that they've lost that connection to the, the beginnings and the roots of of yoga so maybe we can start there and then hear about what you how you integrate your experiences with india today what's interesting is that if you are in india and say you do yoga that doesn't mean the poses that we do in america in america Mm -hmm. yoga is is synonymous with doing uh physical poses and it's the physical aspect but in india it's much more a mental uh uh, quest that you look to quiet the mind and kind of the meditation aspects. The word yoga means to yoke together, to merge the individual soul with the absolute. And how can we um, make that connection more real for us in our day-to-day lives? Mm-hmm. So um, I went, went uh, about 10 years ago, I went to a, um, a kind of a, a course there that was held at a Christian ashram. Um, and it was, uh, it was to really um, spend some time in, in, in deep meditation and, and understanding. And the physical aspect of yoga, I was on my own for. So I got up very early at five. The most exotic birds were nearby in the jungle. And it was just a sublime time to do a yoga practice. But as part of that workshop that I took, uh, we went to a facility that was run only by women. Now, most yoga ashrams, which is a community for st- yoga study, are run by men. Hmm. But this particular um, ashram was run only by females, yoginis. And uh, their mission was to make a difference in their community by educating girls who comes from, come from such poor families that the families couldn't afford the simplest fees for education. But not only did they educate um, 450 girls at a time from kindergarten through high school, they also housed and fed and clothed 150 of these girls who were so poor that the, you know, and often it was that the father had died or something had happened to the father and the mother had no recourse but to work hard labor. And uh, as I got to know this community, um, I I asked about some of the girls' parents and uh, one woman, uh, you know, she made $20 a month. Literally, that was her salary. So, I was, um, my heart went out to this, this group of yoginis and I asked them, well, what's your greatest need in, in helping school the girls? And they said, well, we need a bathing facility. And I said, well, where do they bathe now? And she goes, well, down by the road or, you know, no, she said they bathe, bathe in a large open area. And I was thinking back to my high school days where we had showers in this big, you know, big open room. And I thought she was talking about privacy. She said they need privacy. Well, it turns out they, they, they went down to the road. They had to bathe in their clothes because there was no privacy. It was just on the street. Oh and my God. so I said, well, this facility that you want to build, how much is it going to cost? And she thought they could, they could build showers for 15 and 10 toilets and, um, and then also another washing area. And it would only cost about $15,000. And I said, well, how are you going to raise the money? And she goes, we don't know. And I said, well, I've never raised money before, but I bet I can ask the people that I know and my, my mailing list if they'd contribute. And literally, I did raise all 15000 Went there in person. I've sent it in chunks. Uh, and we, got, we watched the progress of this building going up. And then went there to document it. And of course, 
it was wonderful. But while I was there, she said, well, would you like to hear our next project? <laughs> a second story on the high school so we can educate twice as many girls. I mean, like, who, who wouldn't want to help with that? <laughs> so yeah, that's amazing. Um, your dollars, you know, US dollars go a long, long, long way. And someone said, you know, well, why would you want your US dollars going out? There's so many people in our country that need help. And I agree. I give generously in those areas, but my heart went out to these, these amazing women who have dedicated their lives to helping in whatever way they can. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and even just thinking about the, the simple thing of having a space to get clean and um, being able to imagine these girls who have to bathe on the side of the, the road in front of other people. Um, yeah. Just, yeah, they, just the level. I'm, I'm reminded always of the level of bashfulness that, that children have and my son has now, you know, and he's 10. And um, so the idea of even if you have your clothes on, A, you're not getting clean super well, but also um, still, you know, your body is being shown that way as well, which isn't comfortable for, for kids. So that's an amazing gift that you did that. Well, and also, and what, go ahead. What also happened is that in order to thank me, they, um, my husband and I went, they wanted us to have a meeting with the, the head um, yogini and she gave us a mantra practice, which is repetition of some uh, sounds that have a, a strong vibratory effect mm. for certain things. And so we, 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 my husband and I did that. And um, it was the first time that it's in yoga, it's called japa, which is repetition. And um, it was amazing to do that. Then when we funded the school, we were given the next level, but we were told, listen to this, we were told we needed to to repeat this nine syllable mantra. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Not 9,000 times, not 90,000 times, but 900,000 times. Wow. So we actually did that. We, they said, you better do a million. You don't want to come up short. Right. <laughs> so it took us two years of pr some pretty intense work, but I was, I was so grateful because I wanted to see how that would affect my, my mind and my brain. So how did, so how did you go about that? So you have a nine syllable mantra that they instructed you to do, and that was meant to help you to bring, um, your goals to fruition for the school or for your life or no, it was, it was the second one we did was for, for us individually. And it was considered a, a mantra of protection. And what, what do you think the difference? So how did you go about that? A million saying a nine syllable. Um... Well, my husband is an engineer. So he, <laughs> so he made a chart and every day we recorded your, we were given a crystal necklace of 108 beads mm -hmm. and you use your, your fingers to, to rest on each bead while you say the mantra one, one repetition of the, of the whole necklace is 108 repetitions. So we'd write down, I'd have a little thing on my phone, a little counter. Okay, I just did another group of 108. And so my husband set up this spreadsheet. He loves Excel. Uh, how many we did a day? How many was that over a week, over a month? And so we kept track of where we were. And that's how we knew, you know, we, we recorded each time we did 108. So it took a lot of dedication to, but we both did it and um and they little did we know but they really tested us when we went back and they did a special ceremony and they said because nothing whatsoever went wrong with the ceremony they know we did all million repetitions so oh, wow do you do you feel like you 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 can attribute any changes or experiences in your life to doing those repetitions oh absolutely when you uh, focus the mind in that way, I have much more uh, peace inside mm. as a result of doing that. Uh, my, I, my thoughts don't get carried away. I am, uh, I am not run by my thoughts. Instead, I look for a place of spacious peace. <laughs> Space of spacious peace. That's great. I, I love that. That's what you're saying. You got from it too. I, I feel like often, and this isn't to, 
to throw shade on any of those other outcomes. But I think just the idea, often people say, oh, you do a mantra and you're going to lose weight. You do, if you do this, if you say an affirmation, it's going to get you a million dollars. And those might all be true or not true. But I just love the idea that what you got out of that was, was spaciousness and peace. Mm -hmm. And 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 from there, really, the sky is the limit. So I love that that's the, the first thing that you named that you got out of that practice and the dedication you put into it. Because that's also just a big act of faith to to say a mantra a million times and to, for both of you to really put that in action with some sincerity is, is really beautiful. Yeah. 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 I'm so grateful for the opportunity yeah. to, to have had the guidance to know what to do and then to do the work. I mean, ultimately, isn't that what it comes down to? We learn things that may have potential to really change us in a positive way, but until we do the work, we don't get the fruit of the practice. Yeah, that's right. We're going to, uh, I want to say goodbye to you in a moment, but I'm wondering if before we go, and I'm so grateful to have had you on the show because I've, I've learned a lot and um, you're an inspiration to me. Um, for folks that are just starting out, um, as you said, it's never too late. What's a, what's a good way to start to integrate um, mindfulness practices or yoga practices into your life. As I've said, I work with a lot of educators who have kind of turned that part of their lives off or feel like they don't have permission for that in the midst of all of what they're doing. So what are some, some advice from you on ways to get started? I think uh, because right now my focus is the breath, I think if people did this before getting out of bed in the morning and set the, set the, set the alarm to go off again, and also to go to sleep at night. So many people have trouble going to sleep. If you do, did 10 of the breaths with the exhale being twice the length of the inhale, that often is enough to put people right to sleep or to help them when they wake up and can't go back to sleep. So giving the mind some place to rest. But uh, if people can, you know, what's available on the internet is, is so amazing these days and people should be able to find a yoga practice that works for them. I think most of my, well, all of my DVDs are available on Amazon or my website. Actually, I'm, I'm sl uh, in the process of, of changing my store and, and I don't have most of my DVDs available except for the latest ones. Um, but I, I think to find a teacher that they love maybe try a yoga class, uh, make that time for themselves. It's most yoga classes run between an hour and an hour and a half. That's a big chunk of time for many people, but the more that you can set aside time for yourself because you're the most important person in your world. And it all, it all really flows from the qualities that you bring to your own life. Uh, you then, then you're able to touch your students or your colleagues in a way that's profound. Oh, I appreciate you naming that. So yeah, just, just even taking a few minutes for that self-care is, is a big thing for me. And I think it's the key to transforming our education system is to give educators permission to, and in fact, almost mandate that they take care of themselves, that it can't be this afterthought that we really need to start to fill ourselves up first. And I really appreciate you naming that can be as simple as 10 breaths. If you want to go to the, the hour, hour and a half long yoga practice, fine. But I think often the idea that it has to be that hour and a half long yoga practice is what stops people from doing anything. Well, you know, I made a series of relaxation CDs. One of the shortest ones was designed for people called Stress Relief, designed for people when they got home from work because I needed something. Sometimes I would go into the garage with my car getting home from work and I told my kids, hey, if I don't come in right away, just give me this space. I'm going to be a much nicer person. And I would listen to a, a, a guided relaxation for 10 or 15 minutes. And that would put me in a much more neutral place so that I could go in and interact with my family who were the most precious people to me. I, you know, and so they knew, you know, yeah, give mom the space. She's, <laughs> she's home in the garage, but she's, she's taking care of herself so that she can take better care of, our, of them. Well, and that's great too, because that's a, those are another like good point to bring up, which is that at transition points, it's a really powerful time and place to do it when you're transitioning from work to home yeah. and having the self awareness that you need that space and that your family gave it to you is beautiful. We didn't even get to talking about your hypnotherapy practice and, and all the other work that that you Maybe do. Another time. Um, 
Yeah. Another time. This has been such a gift, uh, Peggy, to have you on the show. Um, I'll have links to your website on my website. And uh, are there any other ways folks should know how to connect with you? That's probably the best just to go onto the website. I have a section where I list where I teach. I would really encourage people to come to a workshop. I teach at a large yoga facility called Kripalu. And it's so wonderful just to dive into a retreat center and really learn something that you can take home. My commitment always in my classes is to give people enough so that they can take home a practice that will change, begin to change them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Peggy. I really appreciate your time today. Right. And we'll be back in a couple of moments to, to wrap up this show of Your Three Eyes. I can't believe the time always passes so quickly. But uh, thank you again for jumping in. And um, I learned so much today. So thank you, Peggy. Well, thank you so much for having me as a guest. I love talking thank with you. you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Mm, Bye. again for joining us. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Your Three Eyes. I want to thank Peggy Cappy again for joining us. She joined us at the last moment. So as I said, today is Friday the 13th and um, things happen on Friday the 13th. So our original guest, Zen Cryer de Brooke, was injured at the last moment and she connected us with Peggy. And I'm, I'm so glad that she did. I'm sorry that Zen was injured and she'll join us on a later show. Um, but it was really wonderful to talk about her experiences and, and some of the things that she talked about um, that I, I really appreciated were around just ways that we can access uh, self-care and um, that mind-body connection all the time. So um, we don't need to wait for um, a class. We don't need to um, seek special instruction necessarily, although sometimes it's helpful. But just it's a just it really requires a commitment to ourselves to be able to take that time for ourselves. So some of that can be as simple as, um, as Peggy named those 10 breaths where the out breath is longer than the in breath or knowing that you need some transition time and taking those moments to transition between home to work and work to home again with our students. <coughs> Excuse me, of course I'm coughing today. It's Friday the 13th. Everything's happening today. With our students, we can also offer those moments of transition within the classroom we can transition into our classes with a lot more deliberateness and care. And we can provide our students with this opportunity to be able to connect back in, calm their nervous system so that they can participate. I loved the notion that Peggy talked about with the SAT students, take, the students taking the SAT, that they can um, connect back in with their own higher knowing by calming down for a moment first. <coughs> course I'm choking. Um, so being able to take that time to be able to connect back in with themselves so that they can um, access the knowledge that they have that when we start to panic or start to get into our heads a little bit, we can lose sight of. So as I mentioned, uh, this is the beginning of a three or four part series on your three eyes around building that mind body connection. In my book, An Educator's Guide for Using Your Three Eyes, I talk about this a lot that we really need to start with deepening the relationship and the commitment we have to ourselves so that we can be effective educators. And, and Peggy talked about that today as well, that when we 
take care of ourselves and we build a commitment to ourselves, then suddenly we're able to show up in our education settings, in our classrooms, with our students, with our families, um, with ourselves in a much more deep and meaningful and loving way. And when we can do that, the way that we come across, the safety in the space that we create for our students and um, yeah, the, the ability to create a nurturing environment for our students will help them to learn and grow a lot more. So over the course of the next few weeks, we'll be, we'll be doing a few different things. I'll be um, posting both on my website and via social media, different techniques folks can do. So I'll give opportunities for little one pagers and access to different ideas about how to build that mind body connection. Um, I will also be, um, yeah, filling in, uh, interviewing some different guests that have some information on that. And I will also be at the end of this kicking off uh, a live version of the Beliefs Lab course that I offer. The Beliefs Lab is a course that helps people to start to connect in with the, the stories and the ideas, um, the beliefs that we have about ourselves that so often run unchecked, especially when we're not connecting back in with our bodies more. And one of the ways that we, modalities we talk about in the Beliefs Lab is actually connecting back in with our bodies. And once we make that connection, we can really get more clear about it can be, how it can be supportive for us. So um, be on the lookout. The Beliefs Lab will be going live soon, and I'll be providing information about how to, to, to enroll in that course. Um, you'll be able to spend five with, weeks with me hanging out. I also would love to invite you to to purchase my book. It's on for Kindle. It's a dollar, so not a lot of money, um, but I think it has a lot of valuable resources for educators and really just gives you that permission to take care of yourself. Again, in the coming weeks, we'll have that Zen Cryer to Brook interview um, posted and ready to go for everyone, and we will also. Um, be connecting in with some other guests that talk about how to build a mind-body connection. I want to thank Peggy Cappy again for joining me today. And at the last moment, I want to thank Zen for connect, making that connection with Peggy. Uh, I thank all of you for listening and I look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you.